This was a conversation with John McWhorter. John is a professor of linguistics at Columbia University. He's a writer and public intellectual, and best known as one of the most compelling speakers on the topic of race in America. His latest book is called Woke Racism, and he says he felt he had to write it. This book was written out of duty. I don't think most people quite understand that I don't wake up thinking about these things, that my life is about much more, and that these issues for me are a background business. But given what I was seeing happening to the way people were thinking about Black people in this country, particularly over about the past two years, and I've been doing this as a duty for about 21 years, but especially I decided something needed to be said. I'm hoping that it serves the purpose that I wanted, which is to teach people that you have to stand up to this crowd. You can't just let them have what they want or they're going to turn the world upside down. The book is subtitled how a new religion has betrayed black America. I'm not saying it's like a religion. I'm not making that point to get attention. I had all the attention I wanted before. I'm saying that that religion is real and I am privileged in that I see myself witnessing the birth of one. It's happening. We are watching a religion being born. You could even think of it as another Abrahamic religion. I'm fascinated by it, but it's also a religion that hurts black people. And as such, I have to speak against it. This was a conversation and Q&A in our digital campfire. To join conversations like this, check out our membership options below and hope you enjoy it. Welcome, John. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. I guess the clue is in the title to, to a great degree, but I'd love if you could just give us a quick overview of the, the book for people here who maybe haven't read it. Well, what it's about is that there has arisen a way of thinking um, in the United States and actually beyond where what is considered most important is showing that you know that racism exists. And that's important. But showing that you know racism exists has split off from actually thinking about what helps, for example, Black people who have problems. And I have a major issue with that because a lot of things are being espoused that hurt or don't help Black people in the name of just showing that you have this higher awareness. And I think that that higher awareness is analogous in almost eerily precise fashion to the sense a person might have that they want to show that they have faith. It's all about showing something about yourself rather than helping other people. And it's important to realize that the kind of person I'm talking about is of all colors. This is not a book only written to Black people. It's not a book only written to white people. It's written to everybody. And it is a book written mainly with the idea that I see something that's hurting Black people, and I think that it needs to be said in clear language, and that's what I tried to do. The book is not an exegesis about religion. I'm not a theologian, and I wouldn't have written a book that was only about showing that this is like a religion. I made that point in various journalistic articles. My main issue was to say that this religion has a really negative effect upon the fate of Black lives. That's the point of the book. So that's what woke racism is. Do you not sense that there is a shift? I mean, there certainly seemed to be a backlash, especially against someone like Robin DiAngelo and someone like Ibram Kendi seems under more pressure than, than ever before. Like, do, do you sense that there is some kind of a shift? Even, and, and your book, I guess, is, is part of that shift, that, that there is a growing awareness, that there is this, this worldview out there and there is it's becoming more permissible to push back against it? Or do you not do you not agree with that? I feel that there is a backlash gradually happening. I'm hoping my book is playing some small part in it. And I think that that backlash is necessary for us to have a mature society. Um, I don't think that people like Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi think of it as an intelligent backlash. I don't think that they feel that their views have been questioned in any useful way. They, like all of us in some ways, they're fish that don't know that they're wet. People like that think that what's going on is that racism is rearing its ugly head and that they're doing the good work. That's what they'll always think. But from the outside, if a person is standing on the shore, yes, more people are willing to venture to be Spartacuses now than were a year ago. And that's what has to happen. We have to start standing up to those people and not kicking them out, but just standing up to them and telling that kind of person, you can't have everything you want and you're not going to get everything you want, even if you call me a white supremacist on Twitter. You have to just let them yell. But no, I don't think that the main practitioners will ever 
have that kind of awareness. That's not how human beings work. But those of us who are trying to live our lives regardless, yes, I see more positive signs now than I did six months ago. And what do you think it is that keeps this this kind of perspective in place? Is it the social shaming? Is it the sense that um, there are there are serious consequences for disagreeing? Yeah, nobody wants to be called a racist on Twitter. And I don't mean that to sound reductive. It's mostly Twitter. You don't want to be called a white supremacist on social media. And that's progress. That wouldn't have been nearly as potent a shaming tool, say, 30 years ago. But these days, most people would almost rather be called a pedophile than a racist. That's a good thing in itself. But it does mean that if there's a certain kind of person who's on social media, just like the rest of us, I don't think they choose this weapon deliberately. But if you cross them, they're going to call you that terrible name in the public square. For a great many people, they'd rather lie a little bit. They'd rather pretend to believe something than endure that because they have groceries to buy and kids to raise and they're trying to do their job. And so it ends up being this unfortunate situation where what looks to the elect as if their view is the proper one and is for that reason making its way into society is really making its way into society because most people are just afraid of them. And that won't work. That's not the way things are supposed to be. They'll never understand that. But the rest of us, and we vastly outnumber them, have to start understanding it and acting on it. And do you think it's, do you feel a sense of responsibility in terms of pushing back? Because as a, as a black man, you are obviously to some degree immune from the worst of the accusations of, of being a racist. I mean, obviously you can be kind of described as a self-hating or a grifter or any of those kind of I, I guess what what are the things that you are personally accused of and and do you think that you are do you feel a sense of responsibility for for speaking out in the way that you do? Yeah, this was um this book was written out of duty. I don't think most people quite understand that I don't wake up thinking about these things, that my life is about much more, and that these issues for me are a background business. But Given what I was seeing happening to the way people were thinking about Black people in this country, particularly over about the past two years, and I've been doing this as a duty for about 21 years, but especially I decided something needed to be said because, yeah, I'm Black, and that means that I can be called self-hating, but nobody really believes it. Nobody really thinks that I hate myself for being Black. Nobody thinks I have a problem with ego. You can say it, but it's a performance, and you can say that I'm a grifter. And, you know, I don't recognize the charge. I'm not. And most people don't believe that either. And so you just get the view out there without it being so easy to say that I'm just a racist. And I was also driven by the fact that I'm 56. If I were in my 30s, I would be dismissed as too young. If I were in my 70s, I'd be dismissed as out of touch. At this age, it's just right. I'm in the middle. So if you're going to dismiss me, you have to take on my argumentation. So, yeah, I did it on purpose as a 56 year old black man with a certain foot in the door in the media so that I knew that the book would be published and would get some attention. And um, I'm hoping that it serves the purpose that I wanted, which is to teach people that you have to stand up to this crowd. You can't just let them have what they want or they're going to turn the world upside down. What would a healthy conversation around race look like? Well, in this case. I say in the book that there are things that Black people who need help need. There is a war on drugs that needs to be eliminated. We need to refine how reading is taught, especially to poorer Black kids. And we need to go back to focusing on vocational education as the way that underserved people climb into the middle class. Those things are very, very important to the Black community. But what really needs to happen is a new sort of script that people need to be familiar with, which is that If you can handle it, if your life trajectory can handle it, if you're in an organization where a small cadre of people insist that the whole organization needs to be focused solely on battling white power differentials and that nothing else is important until probably 50 years are spent doing that, people like that need to be told no. And they're going to be extremely upset. They're going to call you names on social media. They're going to have little protests. But people like that need to learn that no matter how loud they yell. They're not always going to get what they want. They might get some. They have to bargain just like the rest of us, but we're not all just going to bow down to this radical leftist legal philosophy that really isn't any more plausibly applied 
to a mature society than pure Marxism is. We can't pretend that we can't see through this. And that's a script that I think will be hard for a lot of people. It's hard to be called a racist by a white person. As often as not, this is a white person who doesn't want their colleague to call them that. But we're going to have to get used to that floating in the air and realize, just like I know, somebody says, you know, this is a self-hating Negro. I know that's not true, so it doesn't touch me. If a colleague says, well, aren't you a white supremacist? You should be able to think to yourself, no, I'm not. Hard, if it's a white person, then imagine it being a black one. I can put myself in the white mind and imagine how this must feel. A black person is going to tell you, well, then you're a white supremacist and you should take a deep swallow, plant your feet on the floor and think, no, I'm not. And it hurts me in a way that I have to resist the teachings of a black person, given what black people do go through here and there. But no, I'm not. And the truth is, it's just like when a relationship ends and a year later, you realize that you got through it and that it was time for it to end. Six months later, you'll look back on that encounter and you'll realize it was the right thing to do for everybody concerned, black and white. White Americans, educated white Americans need to steal themselves and get used to that. Or all of our intellectual, artistic and judicial institutions are going to be overrun by an ideology that one, doesn't make sense, and two, hurts brown people. And you describe it as a new religion. In, in the book, and you described it that way a few times. Why do you think, do you think it's something about the sort of secularization of society that has led us to kind of attach the same kind of religious fervor to ideologies or to other things that, are, that were not previously religions? See, this is where I can't speak with authority because I am not trained to address that kind of question as opposed to the linguist that I am. However, it would be odd if that didn't have something to do with it. People are seeking a sense of transcendence. And if you don't get it from the old time religion, even if it was relatively formulaic, then something in you is going to seek something else. Certainly a lot of it is wanting a sense of belonging, wanting a sense of purpose in the world. These are natural human desires. This is on both the white and the black sides of the aisle. But those things are such powerful attractants for any human being that you will tolerate things not making sense and sometimes even hurting black people because you're looking for that sense of wholeness. People want that. Humans are social creatures. So yes, I do think that that's part of it because we're seeing, I literally think, as I say in the book, I'm not saying it's like a religion. I'm not making that point to get attention. I had all the attention I wanted before. I'm saying that that religion is real and I am privileged in that I see myself witnessing the birth of one. I think some people who are actually theologians would love to go back and watch Christianity emerging because there was only so much that was being written down. I'm watching a religion emerge. I figure that if I have another 30 or 40 years, I will be able to see it gradually formalizing. I'd be interested to know what the actual name of the religion is going to end up being, but there will be one. There will be buildings other than university buildings that are devoted to worshiping in this religion. The word worship won't be used. It'll take 100 years before that would happen. But already, many university buildings are the churches, but you don't use that word. Soon there will be buildings for these people. It's not going to be called for the elect. It'll be called something else, but it's happening. We are watching a religion being born. You could even think of it as another Abrahamic religion. I'm fascinated by it, but it's also a religion that hurts Black people. And as such, I have to speak against it. Mm. And I mean, I, I find that fascinating. You, you also hinted at that, that there is some issue with what the name of this is. I mean, Wesley Yang talks about the successor ideology, and there seem to be kind of regular discussions about the, the word is never right. Like you're always kind of said, well, woke is not the right word, or the successor ideology is not the right word. And there's a, there's a kind of discussion at the moment around terminology and sort of a refusal to be defined as well. Um, as a linguist, you must be fascinated by that phenomenon in itself. It hasn't happened yet that there's a title. I can tell that the elect is not going to catch on either. That's mine, but that's not going to be the one. But eventually there will be a name and you can't know where that name is going to come from. These things are a matter of chance. The word woke, you know, coming out of a mostly dormant black slang word because of the hipness of a certain hip hop artist or two about 10 years ago, who would ever have known? And in the same way, it's hard to know what 
this religion will be called. Anything that you try to impose will be resisted because the people in question don't know that they're a religion. And it's natural to post enlightenment people to resist being grouped. You want to stress your individuality. But gradually, something will happen, probably by accident. You know what I'm going to guess? There's going to be a song. It's probably a pop song that that crowd is going to adopt. And the name of the song will accidentally start being applied to the whole ideology itself. I'm, I'm Now I'm going by the seat of my pants. The song will be by a Black artist and therefore will be seen as very hip and true and demotically compelling. As such, even the people themselves will start jokingly referring to themselves on the basis of the name of that song. A generation will go by and it will be less clear to people what the song was and what relationship it had. And after a while, that'll be the name. It's going to be something like that. That's how language happens. But it won't be something that some journalist imposes from on high. I'd love to know what that song is going to be, because now I'm thinking it's going to be a song. We'll see. That's what's beautiful about that, John, is that you've just given a prophecy of, <laughs> of, how, <laughs> of where this religion is going to be named. So you will, in a way, be the prophet of this new, if it happens, you will have been the prophet of this new religion. <laughs> I hope not, but I take your point. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask one last question on this same topic. Um, please do check out the Q&A form, upvote the questions or add your questions to it, and we'll come to those very shortly. Um, I mentioned it before, John, you were speaking to Coleman Hughes, and I thought it was a really fascinating. Um, you had slightly different perspectives on whether there had to be a religious dimension to, I'm, I'm, I may be garbling this slightly, but the, the pushback to this. So. So Coleman was saying that Martin Luther King was such a transformative, uniting figure because he had that religious dimension. He was able to hold up something above the, the kind of secular world, beyond the division by saying, and, and I think Coleman's view was that something like that was needed. And I think you were more reluctant to go into that as an atheist. Have you, what would be your perspective? Have you thought about that since? Because it does seem like a very interesting question of whether there actually does need to be a sort of a, a religious solution to this kind of very um, divisive identity framing. I'd like to see, as I think some people hope there can be, a way of processing post-enlightenment, modern 21st century blue American life in a way that's uplifting but without it being about those books written in Mesopotamia, et cetera. I know there are people who can imagine that more easily than I can. Um, we're fish who don't know they're wet. I, I find it hard to get out of my skin. I don't seek that sense of transcendence. Or frankly, I get it from going to a good musical. That to me is, that's church, that'll do. But I know that's just me. That's not most people. And so, um, yeah, it'd be nice I can't imagine it because I'm just not a religious person, but maybe it's true that for the wind to really get underneath the wings of something, you need something larger than just logical argumentation. Sure, I can, I can, I can see that, but I, I find it hard to get beyond my own little bubble of thought in imagining just how that would happen. Awesome. So we're going to start, we're going to come to the first question, and that's Ron Walkow. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, hey, John, I've been enjoying your work for years, so it's a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, Thank never you. Mi never miss you on The Glenn Show, one of my favorites. <laughs> I do uh, that so, right here. Yep. <laughs> right. Yeah, so my question is about persuasion. Um, like uh, many others who broadly share your views, I'm starting to find that a lot of the segments of the anti-woke are becoming as strident and obnoxious and even almost religious in nature as the woke. So we're really like polarizing, getting this extreme culture war. So I'm wondering, can you do you see what might be a kind of effective and thoughtful pushback to the woke religion you talk about that's actually persuasive to people holding it or gives them permission maybe to hold other views? And I'm even curious on your work, are you hearing that kind of feedback or do you feel like you're preaching to the choir uh, more? Um, on my book, there's some people who feel like I, I push too hard and that I'm, I'm too rhetorical. And um, on that, I politely disagree in that 
many of the people who say that, if they were writing a book against the alt-right, would use the exact same tone and find that that was exactly what they needed to do. I think that there's an extent to which where one perceives shrillness is based on where one's sentiments happen to lie. But in, indeed, after a while, and I know this from my academic work where we're talking about things that you know nobody needs to know beyond a couple hundred people, but when you yell, even people who agree with you start getting irritated. It just doesn't work after a while. And so you have to tone it down. And there's the fine line between toning it down and not saying anything. Like there's some writers about race who are frankly smarter than me, but who do so much hedging and so much well maybeing that it's hard to know where they stand. And so they're never really making what I regard as a contribution. And I don't mean that with disrespect. They are better than me, really. They're thinking about it in a very multifaceted way, but they don't want to say anything. And so I, I think one is responsible for saying something and possibly offending in the process. But yeah, um, my woke racism, for example, is a shot over the bow. And almost everything I've written since, I've tried to be a little bit more reasoned. Because yeah, yell too much. And except for a certain kind of person who likes reading yelling, I'm that kind of person. You know, or like, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, the Albee play? I can sit through that and it's like the three bears. I am, I enjoy watching people tearing each other to pieces. That's just me. That is not most people. I'm aware of that. And so that cannot be the happy warrior tone that those of us use. Yeah, that's that's a very important point. Including Glenn. You know, Glenn and I fight over that when I'm telling Glenn, you know, what is the point of this? You know, and it's I think it's an important discussion. Right. Um, Zach McKinney. Hi, John, and, uh, and thanks a lot. Um, my question is um, actually takes sort of a linguist angle, and I'm wondering if you see any potential for um, expanding the definition as we observe it of the term diversity to, to include and encompass intellectual and viewpoint diversity in addition to the, uh, the demographic varieties that it's uh, very often understood to mean. Is there is there a way that we can you know participate as as allies and and positive actors in conversations of you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, but subtly interpret that and and put it into practice in a way that incorporates also um, you know all of the dimensions of diversity that we want to include there. That should be fostered, but you have to realize the nature of the resistance that you'll encounter. This is what I mean by the religious analysis makes things make sense. So diversity, we all know what that word is supposed to mean and we know how it's used in practice. It makes perfect sense that people are that comfortable with that narrow definition of diversity. If you realize that they are within an ideology where the central purpose is battling white power. And therefore, of course, they're gonna use diversity in a way that means diversity of certain underserved people from white Americans, as opposed to what diversity really means. One way to have an intermediate step between diversity as you mean it, Zach, and diversity as it's been meant since 1978 in American parlance is to focus on socioeconomic diversity. And that's an argument that I think the country is more ready for than it was even 20 years ago to say, does this have to be about Black and Latino people and the occasional Native American, or should we ex extend it to disadvantaged people, even if they're white? That's a way to pull people forward. Then you can talk about, well, how about somebody who's a card-carrying conservative? Isn't that diverse? You know, now that you're used to white people being involved, what about conservative white ones? And then what about somebody, you know, disabled, Mormon, you're from Idaho. What about div real diversity? So, you know, you have to, all people have to be moved slowly, including, including me. But yes, the way diversity is fostered is such that diversity is just this manipulative little code word. It's the saddest thing to watch college administrators in those stiff, itchy clothes, all of them with the reserved manners, all of them so outwardly nice using that word and knowing very well that they're using a code word. It's an unfortunate state of affairs, but it's because of the religion, I think. Wonderful, thanks. I wonder if cultural diversity might, might 
be sort of the tip of the spear and beginning to incorporate some of these aspects, but appreciate the reflection. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Elise. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, this is such a pleasure. John, I discovered you through um, your uh, great course on language and the evolution of language. And I remember that. That was forever ago now, but, um, and then, you know, I found you again, speaking about this and you were actually a huge strength to me when I was sitting on my daughter's school's DEI committee. Oh and, dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she actually no longer attends that school by her choice. So. I think um, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She actually took her best friend with her to the, a different school, so <laughs> Even worked better. out. Um, so my question is, I'm uh, I'm um, on the side. I'm a musician, and I, this song came to me, and um, the song idea of um, kind of just pushing back against this um, this whole thing. Uh, it's called "I Am I Am the Monster," and um, and one of the lyrics in the song is um, pay no attention to the color. It's only whiteness inside because uh, the idea is that um, this group, this, I mean, this is definitely like born out of my experience being on this DEI committee, that this group is labeling people like yourself, like anyone with a dark skin, but the wrong viewpoint is that they're actually just white on the inside. So we mm -hmm. can disregard them. Mm -hmm. um and i just got so frustrated by that um i shared the song with a friend um who's black and his response to the whiteness thing was um he hadn't actually heard that before being used by crt but um it made him think of the term oreo mm -hmm. and i could tell it was actually really upsetting to him that um like he's been called an Oreo and it doesn't feel good. And now it's no. like, I mean, it's something that some black people would be calling other black people who, you know, are whatever, they don't fit the right stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's like with, with CRT adopting this idea of whiteness, it's almost like the, the scholarly so-called scholarly version of Oreo and now white people get to like use this pejorative against black people. I'm just wondering, like, is there a way to take on that, that, that idea of whiteness on the inside and just how demeaning that is and tie it in with how demeaning Oreo is and, and get to a place where we can like stop trying to like, we're really, it's really stereotyping people. It's really all this is, is trying to, force people to adhere to stereotypes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess Oreo is getting old, but yeah, that was the term of art in my day. And um, I have seen the CRT people doing a more refined version of it. Robin D'Angelo of um, white fragility fame. That's her response to people like me that, you know, she never says it outright, but the idea is that we're uncle Tom's. And so we can be mm -hmm. disregarded. The truth is the easy repost to people like that is okay, there's this whiteness that you've made up. What's the blackness? I've done this with one person and just it, frankly, it felt like doing judo. What's blackness? And what the person wants to say is being intuitive, having rhythm and things where they instantly know that they sound like somebody holding a fire hose in the old newsreels. What's blackness? And then somebody in the other part of the room says, well, it's all, it's all, many things. And I say, no, but whiteness apparently is one. So to be white is to be this one thing. Why is it so diverse to be black? And if black is diverse this way and Asian is diverse this way, then are none of those things anything except skin color? And nobody will have an answer. And of course, you realize in situations like this, nobody's going to tell you that you're right. People are just going to walk off mumbling and they're going to call you a white supremacist. But, you know, they they heard you. And it's the beginning of understanding. But yeah, it's absurd. You know, you're white inside, but what does that mean? What's black? And I really think that we're at a point where an awful lot of people are very confident in this idea of whiteness studies. I remember when that was a sideline concern when I taught at Berkeley 25 years ago. But the question is, what's blackness in a way that you 
would feel comfortable representing on a hot mic in front of people? And they don't really have an answer to that. And then maybe you can have a more coherent conversation. Or if any of them are actually going to come out and say that Blackness is not being on time and not getting the right answer and being communal and et cetera, well, they look like such an idiot that that fosters the discussion. But yeah, I hear you. It won't do. It has to be, it has to be countered with steely-eyed argumentation. Thank you for that. It leaves me wondering if I should like release this song or not, because I, like, I don't want to be hurtful in any, you know, like this. And this goes back to one of the earlier questions about how do we talk about this in a way that's productive? You know, um, I don't want to be adding to the problem. I don't want to just be fanning flames. Often, often it is valuable to just ask a question, watch the floundering answer and leave it. There's no point in making people angry. You know, the idea is not to go like that because that just leaves a person shutting down. But if you ask that kind of question and hold the gaze steady and the person gives an answer, they know it's not an answer and then just leave it. And then the next person asks the question that makes more progress than having an argument with somebody in that setting. That's kind of a dinner party thing. Just ask a question and leave it. And then you'll hear a year later that that question made somebody think. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my sense of that sort of thing. Thank you, John. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good practical tip, John. I wonder if you have any other kind of open questions that you think are worth kind of or good ones that you can kind of use or throw in. Well, they come up according to the situation. I don't <laughs> I don't have a list in my <laughs> head, but one that comes up in my mind is. Okay, you think standardized tests are racist. Okay, why? And the person says they're biased. Ask how. Nobody ever has an answer to that one. But they'll say, still, they must be biased because black kids tend not to be as good at them. They're racist, so we have to get rid of them. Then you say, so are you saying that black children should not be subjected to tests of abstract cognitive ability? Just leave it. And whatever they say, just leave it because it's clear that they are saying that black kids aren't bright and they know it. Now, to push it any harder than that is to call them a dirty name and then they shut down. But just to leave that there, that's one of the ones that I've used. I've used that actually in some radio interviews. It works. Just leave it there. Awesome. So, Mike Stroh. Hi, John. This is awesome. I love being part of this community. We get to do these amazing things. So I've been listening to you and Glenn and just lots of your talks over the past few years. And I listened to uh, Woke Racism through audiobook. Um, So I'm trying to follow along as best I can and figure out how to insert myself into this because I have a lot of friends who I talk about this stuff all the time. And I really think I need to speak out loud as you often encourage people to do stand up and say stop or no so my my sort of specific question along that line is i i want to communicate to maybe the you know you had a recent conversation you've probably had somebody with nathan from the, um what was the name of his publication current affairs do you remember that that would be a hard one to forget yes yeah okay cool so i like i would like to try to speak to that type of person in a way. So the ally, so to speak, who, who you so nicely put, you know, is told that silence is violence and that they need to let black people speak and shut up type of thing. And you talked a little bit about it with Coleman Hughes, this idea of like the victim mentality and it feels good to feel offended and then project yourself as like morally superior and, and point the finger and be condemning and that kind of stuff. I, 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 so I wonder one, like, I don't see that being pointed out very much. And obviously that's a hard thing to do because it fits into that blaming the victim type of thing. Um, but I do see like fair, so I'm part of fair Canada or fair Ontario, whatever fair seems to be helping promote a much more collective common humanity perspective. And so I guess what I'm just curious about your thoughts are is specifically, and I have a hard time being specific in these questions, is 
how might we have that common humanity dialogue more thoroughly? And then also, it, do you think it's helpful, I guess, for quote unquote white people to quote unquote talk to other white people and help them see their own fear or guilt or shame that they're not like, they don't feel comfortable saying, yeah, that's fucked up. Like, don't call me racist and a white supremacist. Like, what the fuck? I like, it's so, so I'm trying to help people like be able to say that it's not okay to be called those names and just like discounted. And I think I'll stop with that. Thank you for listening. <laughs> well, I think that um, the main thing, if I understand your question, is that in yeah. those conversations, say with other white people, the question should always be, and that helps Black people how? And mm. it should just always be clear. And sometimes people will have answers to that question. It's not like I feel like I've got all of these magic answers, but just the issue is however we discuss this, that helps Black people how? And to make sure that that's always what people have in mind, as opposed to just showing that they understand that racism is more than the N-word and burning crosses on people's lawns, I think that needs to very much be there. And I think it's particularly important. It's funny, you mentioned that Nathan Robinson interview. I had a um, an interview last week with um, a hard left guy who basically jumped me. You know, it was, it, was, it was rather dishonest that he invited me onto his show, but you know, life is not perfect. And the main way that I dealt with him was just that no matter how much he scoffed, no matter how much he laughed, don't break. And just keep on saying, no, I don't agree with that. No. Notice that I just kept saying no. And he didn't like it, but it rattled him a little bit because he seemed to think that I was just going to crumple to the ground. People like that are generally under the impression that they have arrived at the ultimate truth. I can see why they think that. You have to let them know that you don't think that they do and make sure that you let them know why you don't think they do. And now, of course, in his case, he's hostile. And you're talking about people who are trying to be nice and drinking tea. What kind of conversation are you going to have? And I think that it's civil to just always ask, let's make sure that we're talking about the good of Black people, realizing that the good for Black people is not simply us sitting around saying that we know racism exists. That's not that's not enough. What does this imply for society and especially poor Black people who need help? And I think that keeping one's eye on that star can be pretty can be pretty constructive. Well, can I just add to that? Can I add to that quickly, David? Is that mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I have I think of one person in particular in mind, a really good friend of mine, black guy, Jamaican family. And he's always talking about like his family is very much against white people. Don't talk to white people, white people are trying to get you, et cetera, et cetera. So he's always like sort of conflicted. And do you see or what, what I find helpful to see is Black people expressing that internal dialogue more or BIPOC people, like whatever. Like the words make me almost sick to my stomach. But, and, and yeah, so along this context of like, how do we have more open dialogues about this internal dialogue that the so-called BIPOC POC people or this uh, monolith, right? Like they all think the same, I guess it's the same with the whiteness thing, but like, do you see benefit in that? Or do you see that conversation happening much like from, from, I guess the black person side? Well, yeah, I think it's all, it's all very important. There is a kind of black person who just, you know, thinks white people are awful and that's not going to change. I don't think that that's most Black people. And with many of them, you can understand why they might think it, especially with yeah. ones who are older, with ones who are younger. I think it's often kind of opposed, but nevertheless. But I think most Black people living in the only country that we'll ever know understand that it wouldn't be very constructive to walk around hating white people. There are too many white people and they are too powerful. And so the idea is to break bread and realize, I think for the, for the Black elect, the issue is to understand how exquisitely sensitive to our plight do you really need white people to be? That's something that I've used. I always say, if we're strong, why do you need them to understand so much? And some of them will say, well, they, they have the power, they're on the hook. And then I'll say, okay, even with the power, do they need to understand our psychology so exquisitely? I mean, so exquisitely that 
apparently they never really can. Why are we setting that bar so high? Martin Luther King knew nothing of the sort. That's a good query to throw into the conversation, I think. And that works with Black people really on all parts of the spectrum, in my experience. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up the great work. It's inspiring to watch. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Terry Murphy now, or Teresa Murphy, as you are today. Uh, John, just appreciating so much your courage. I, I think as much as anything you say, your steadfast, solid courage is what helps motivate me, helps inspire me. Um, I hope so. <laughs> Although I don't feel that courageous. I just feel obsessive. But good. thank you anyway. Uh, my situation is my daughter-in-law is the head of a PTA and in a position to be strongly promoting uh, CRT kind of programs. And of course, so it's a white hot dinner table issue. And I'm looking for something that I can be constructive about, like to be able to say, yes, I strongly support more fair treatment and equal access for people of color, for example, that's why I support uh, uh, more equal sentencing or something, something specific that I can really get behind. And I, you know, I heard, I didn't, I might have misheard you, but I, the only thing I heard, you gave a list, I heard literacy, but is, is there any social action that you would prioritize? Yeah. One, vocational education is a huge issue. And the Biden administration was supposedly going to be interested in it. Some things seem to have happened, but the idea was to champion people not going to four years of college, but to two years of vocational school. And to the extent that that's not necessarily a Black issue, still, it takes in so many Black lives that it's important. And also, something I've supported for 15 years now is battling the war on drugs, because the war on drugs has destroyed Black communities for 50 years. And that wasn't necessarily its intention. And there have been Black people who've liked the war on drugs because they want more cops in their neighborhood, not fewer. But the idea of grabbing people and you know, persecuting people and policing people because of this Black market in hard narcotics has never been a good idea. And the war on drugs has never worked. And so you're being a race person to support continuing decriminalization and often more, not just of, of marijuana, that's a good start, but we need to make it so that nobody can make even half of a living working on the black market. If I were an underserved black man, I'd do that. I completely get why that's something that people do. But it, if it weren't available, the same people would embrace vocational education and lead better lives and be more available to their children. So there's certainly that. And then there's the reading business, and it can seem so well, I think you'll get this because of PTA. It's, it's more important than it sounds. It seems trivial to think, well, how people learn how to read. But if a kid doesn't learn how to read well, one, they can't do math. And two, they never like school. And three, guess what happens after they graduate if they do? And so fostering real direct instruction reading programs is a very pro Black issue. I'm watching actually that daughter being taught to read right now. She's six. And um, because she's home this week, I've been hearing like on the computer, the lessons that she gets. And they're being taught like middle class kids with book lined homes. You can imagine what this room looks like, except for what you can see. There's just there are books everywhere. Well, OK, you know, Vanessa learned to read just through breathing my air. But for poor black kids, that method would never work. And it's not the teacher's fault. They're doing what they've been assigned to, to do. But that the administration should be more aware of these sorts of things, I think. So those are my three pillars. Um, those are the ones. There are others. I mean, you could get behind reforming the local police precinct. But boy, that's going to be a tough one. I'm, I'm cynical about that. But that's another thing, too. Thank you. That was great. I hope. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Jochen Weber. Hey, John. Thanks so much for being with us here today. I very much enjoyed your book, listening to your voice, Thank reading you. it. <laughs> and um, I have always been struggling with how to make the decision when to stop talking to certain people. And I may have mis misheard you in the book slightly, 
by interpreting it by you saying something like, uh, for some people, they are too far gone on the woke direction and it's no longer worth talking to them. And maybe you actually also know some people for whom that individually is true, but you know, you don't think that as like for, for groups of people, but I'm curious if you could just like talk a little bit about when for you personally, do you make the decision, okay, this is a lost cause. <laughs> um, opinions will differ on <laughs> where you draw that line. For me, it's immediate. I mean, I'll hear two buzzwords and I figure, forget it. That's it. And then change the subject to something else. And there are always a hundred other things to talk about. But I know people like that, where I remember making their acquaintance and just thinking, ah. and for example, um, <laughs> I know somebody who is um, a really excellent person in the book industry. I'm not going to say who she works for, but she is the partner of a very good friend of mine. And, um, you know, when she came into his life, <laughs> Should I say this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When she came into his life, and it was about five years ago, she said two things. I remember we were at this seafood dinner. She said, um, she is a person, she's not white, she's not black either, but she's something. And she said, Well, with what white people put me through every day, and her partner is white. And yet she said that. And that was my first one. And I thought, okay, it's one of these. And then she said, and this is before Kendi is really famous. She says, you know, this new guy, Kendi? Oh, well, I, I read his book. It's called Stamped from the Beginning. And he came to this event and he was there with his kid, with his dreadlocks and his suit. And it was just, oh, oh, this is long before Kendi and I had any kind of history. I had read the book, but he wasn't a big deal yet. But I remember thinking if that's what she thinks of that book and if what she likes about him is his dreadlocks and his suit and the fact that he's a black man with a child. I thought, I am never going to discuss race issues with this human being again. And I have gotten to know her more since, and it would serve no purpose whatsoever. She and I have a very warm relationship, but we have a tacit agreement not to talk about what she has called what you put on Twitter. There'd be no point. She's brilliant. She's set in her ways for reasons connected partly with her personal history. Her whole sense of worth is built around that kind of, frankly, exaggeration. No point. So two things. She said two things within 10 minutes. And I just thought, eh, and the door closed. Many people would see me as having been too dismissive on that. But then again, I didn't want to have an unpleasant conversation with my friend's partner. So we talk about everything but that. Last conversation I had with her was about bonito powder. We were talking about hondashi because I was making a stew and she was telling me the right hondashi to use. That was a great conversation. We do not need to talk about white fragility. So that that's the way I operate with those things. Great. So we've got two last questions. Um, we're going to finish with Mindalgas as one, but Will, you've got a few to choose from. Do you do you have one in in mind? You're muted at the moment, Will. I beg your pardon. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you, John. And I'll spare you the adulation, although trust me, it's there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, I, I, I posted three questions, but the fourth question that I came up with that I was really curious about is to what degree do you think the elect has internalized this ideology to the point of it becoming a fundamental part of their uh, identity, their self-identity? And um, furthermore, I've noticed amongst the elect, and not just on race issues, but also the various other leftist progressive at all, that there's a fundamental lack of self-awareness. There doesn't seem to be any sort of self-identifying questions or self-interrogating, like, why do I believe the things do I, that I believe? Are they true? May, might I be wrong? So I see you nodding. Okay, so I was wondering if uh, it's possible that you think that secretly, if you factor in that lack of self-awareness, maybe subconsciously, there's a certain kind of member of the elect, one, some, or all, who um, secretly don't actually want things to get better. That because in doing, if things got better, they would have to re-examine their own identity. Yes, that's it. They don't okay. want things to get better. That's why you get something as counterintuitive as the fact that 
you see signs of progress and all the statistics back it up and they resist it. They're almost, they don't want to hear it. You know, for example, there, there are studies that show that the cops actually are more likely to kill a white person than a black person. Now, in terms of roughing people up and attitude, big surprise, black people get the worst of it. But in terms of pulling the trigger, there are now two studies that show that cops are actually more likely to kill a white person. Not that that's good news, but nevertheless, these are compelling studies. And there's a whole crowd of people who are angry to see that even proposed and not because of the math, but because they don't want to know that. Why would you not want to know that? It's because these are people who focus their whole identity on this sort of thing. And no, there is no self-awareness. And that is the way things go. And so I remember being eight or nine and I was, you know, as, as, cynical and cold-hearted in some ways than as I am now. And I remember being nine and telling other black kids, God, really? No. And <laughs> what was interesting to me was, and it's not now, but then they had never considered that anybody would not believe in this God. They had known. How would they know? They were shocked and annoyed. I remember one girl hit me. It was like, how, how dare you? You not believe in God. This is more like eight or nine. That's what these people are like. The elect have no sense of reflection. They think that they are dealing with the good. They wonder why the rest of us don't get it. And that's part of why I say beyond a certain point, leave it alone. You're not going to reach that kind of person. Luckily, those it, it's a minority. But the people who really are elect, go, talk about Japanese cooking because you're, you're just not going to reach them. But yes, I agree with you completely. Can I just do one one more quick one? Because I noticed it in the book and I noticed you talked about it now. And I was just wondering what the rationale was for replacing vocational training with the long-term birth control for young women who want it as part of your three-part plan. Uh, I wondered if anybody, the publisher wouldn't allow that. Um, we had a whole thing about it. It was originally four things. And yeah, if you re read other stuff I wrote, even like 10 minutes before the book, I was also interested in the long-term contraceptives. And I didn't mean that as a black thing. I think all women should be able to have them. And I was really thinking about poverty, but boy, would that help the black community. But no, they, the publisher really pushed it. They thought that that would offend so many people who would be receptive to the book otherwise. And what they meant was um, conservative Christians and or right-wingers. Okay. And that was the one bone I threw. I decided to really stick with a couple of other things in the book, but they really didn't want that. The editor of that book, and I'll name her, her name is Bria Sanford, best editor I have ever had. She made some changes in the text that ordinarily I would have felt as violations. She made it a better book than the way it was on, on Substack, but she would not allow that. And so that's why that's not in it. My honest take is there that too? Yes, I think that we need to focus on that as well, but it didn't make it into the book. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you asking that. Thanks. Great question. Um, John, I've just got one last small question from Mindorgas, if that's okay. We're just at the top of the hour. Um, hello. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'll start uh, with a quote. So, uh, fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. Um, Hermione Granger. <laughs> Uh, is laughter an appropriate response? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> well, it's funny. I'm, I want to go into my Hermione that I use for those books when I'm reading them to the kids. But no, um, I worry about the laughter because it, it it comes off as dismissive. And I think a lot of this stuff is really not um, not funny. I think that all of this is about keeping a cool head and the most important thing is to realize that none of these people are crazy. And I think I just made my partner's girlfriend sound crazy. She's not crazy at all. It's a different way. It's a very different way of looking at the world. And they think we're crazy, but I think we can do them better and realize that they're just very different ways of being human and perceiving things. And we all have our limitations. And that's that can be hard. It can be hard to be yelled at by somebody. But, you know. That's just the way life is if you're doing anything remotely interesting. I mean, there if you live a life without this sort of thing, you're either lucky or all you do is, you know, you play with Play-Doh or you build ships in bottles. If you're gonna push beyond that, well, you know, there, there are gonna be some ruffled feathers, but nobody's crazy and most people are not mean, is my main mantra. And we take it from there. 
Awesome. A uh, really good note to end on. We've got one request in the chat, John, for your Hermione voice. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, we're on this other book now. So Harry is my voice. Ron goes one lower. I make them American because they talk a lot more than Hermione. And I don't feel like doing an accent with them because they talk so much. But oh, I haven't done Hermione in so long. Hermione, Harry, you can't do that. Harry. It's just not what we do. Ron, stop it. Stop it. That's that's Hermione. I'm Hermione Granger. And so that's that's her voice, which is really this middle aged man. But that's the closest I can get. So that's Hermione. And that, that those are three of my Harry Potter voices. <laughs> Fantastic. Amazing. John, thank you so much for coming. Uh, there's a lot of love for you here. Um, and I think a lot of people have already got the book, but if you don't have the book, Woke Racism is out now. And as we usually do at the end of these calls, um, we can unmute ourselves and say thank you to John. John, thank you for, so much for making the time and see you again, I hope. Well, thank, thank you, you ever John. so much. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, folks. John. Have a good thank night. you, John. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.